Well, welcome to New Life. I serve as the lead pastor here alongside my wife, Amanda, and our four wonderful kids, Noah, Heidi, Franklin, and Theodore. And we're just so honored and privileged to be here. When we first took over the church, started preaching a whole lot, the Lord had gave me by his grace... He said, or he allowed me to write out my sermons in manuscript. And those were really dry sermons because I would just read them because I was so nervous. I mean, everyone in the room was way older than I was. Not now, but when we first started. And I was so just nervous. So I just write, I would labor over these huge manuscripts and read them. And some of the logic would just jump huge sharks. And I'm like, how did I get there? I'm like, this is what the paper says. Can't move. This is, this is how we have to stay. We have to stay on track. And so the Lord kind of took me through a progression and said, hey, I want you to just write an outline. So I just wrote an outline and the preaching got better. And the Lord said, probably two years ago, he's like, just bring your Bible and you can figure it out. I'm like, that's not fun at all. I don't like So you're, I'm going from manuscripts to just the scripture. And he gave me like a strategy on how to do that is I have tabs. So if you ever seen my Bible when I preach, I have tabs and they're all color coordinated based on the point that I'm making. So they go in progression. So I always start with the law of first mention. So I go to the first time it was mentioned and then I make progression on that. And it's like all salmon colors, one point, all purple colors, one point. The big tabs are like a sub point. So I have the tab size and the ribbons. It's all a madman's structure to a sermon. And why am I telling you about how we, how I present a sermon, how I present a word? This week, for whatever reason, during worship in the sermon last Sunday, I was journaling. And if, if you know me at all, you know that I love to journal. I love to write. I love things handwritten first. It helps me process differently. It helps me connect with the word differently. And then I'll type it out, make it all pretty. And our Mandy will make it all pretty. <clears throat> so I started writing. I wrote like 12 to 13 pages of just big thoughts that I had, just things that what, what causes a church to grow? What does it mean to be a spirit, to have a life that's led by the spirit? What is tongues? What is the gift of tongues? What's the expression of it? And so I started writing, I don't know, manifestos or position papers on these things for whatever reason. It just have. I'm not a scholarly person, but this is just what was flowing out in that day. Can, is anyone scholarly? I think a scholarly, like Mark and Kathy are super scholarly. Like they hand you a paper, it's all footnotes and it's all, I, the Lord had me start a master's program. And it was our first week in that master's program where and the class I'm in is historical theology. And all of our discussion questions have to be in a certain type font and all this footnotes. I'm like, we're just talking. No one talks like this. No one references, like, this is a discussion, right? No one's referencing other books and doing footnotes and biographies and work cited in an actual, dis- anyway, so I digress. For whatever reason, the Lord has me in this position or this state to begin to write in such a way that it's more of like letters or position papers on certain things. And I didn't know this is where we're going until the Lord kind of mapped that out today or this week. I was texting Robbie and I was like, dude, I have no idea what I'm preaching on. You have anything? (laughs) And he didn't. What'd you do on vacation? This, you're my backup, man. That was, I mean, it's not really joking, but we laugh because it hurts too much to cry. So I'm like, okay, what's the sermon going to be on? And I had no idea until I finished all my classwork yesterday and the Lord took me back to my journal and started to unravel what today was supposed to be. And it's totally different. It's, it's, Back to the old ways I used to do things as far as manuscripts go. And in fact, what I'm going to read, I have printed out in the lobby if you want to take one home so you can actually spend time with the word today. And so I think the Lord is having us go into this new season where it is the ability to move in and out of the spirit like he's been training me to in two years, but also the ability to take the time to work on a craft where it's actually printable, legible, readable, and people can take it home. 
I think he wants to, for our church to walk out this season of carrying his fragrance and singing things in unity. He wants these things to be merged because it's not this or that. I think we have to, we have to abort the word or from our language and we have to say and. Is it local church or missions? It's both. We have to do both. Is it discipleship or just spirit led whatever? Yes, it's and. We have to do both. We have to get and back into our category. So the Lord is having me, he's trained me in so long just to really trust on him. He says, don't count on what you know or what you say. I'll give you the words to say it. How many of you, how many of you would be stressed out about that? Okay, the last two years, that's why I needed a sabbatical. It wasn't anything except for that. That's super stressful. But I'm also not scholarly. So the Lord is kind of, he's making me do both because I think as we live out this final chapter on this earth, it's very important for us to know what we know and to state what we believe clearly without high emotion or being rude. The goal is, could you post this sermon on Facebook and be okay with it? I, th I could. It might, others might not. I'm not worried about others. I'm worried about me and the Lord. So this, this is called life in the spirit. What causes a church to grow? Should a church grow? How big should it grow? Why do some churches grow, but other churches die? See, for far too long, the answer to those questions have led to an unjust murder of the Holy Spirit and the promotion of the wisdom of men. See, it's a lot different when you're reading it. Because now you get to take that section home and read it and sit on that. And I don't have to carry this by myself. We burn the third party of the Trinity on the stake in the public square because he might offend and cause the church to decline. It's okay for us to pray in tongues in our prayer closet, but don't let anyone else know that you are strange. Personal definitions of weirdness or the pastor's comfort levels <clears throat> place unsanctioned boundaries on the Holy Spirit. We would condone theology that, we, that was based only on experience, or sorry, would we condone theology based only on experience? Certainly. Oh, it says certainly not, but it's supposed to be certainly. I apologize. But we, the theology that we do condone is the theology concerning the Holy Spirit. What I'm, let me back that up because I kind of wrote that poorly. We wouldn't condone any theology that was solely on experience and didn't involve the word of God. Except for the theology of the Holy Spirit, we condemn it and make it only an experiential thing and we avoid what the word of God says. The church will grow when the Holy Spirit is given place and prominence above the wisdom or strategies of men. There are personal lives and in the church. This is a need to co, there's a need to co-labor with heaven. There's the book of Ephesians that's all in play. So what I'm trying to communicate there is that when the Holy Spirit is given prominence, not only in this place, but in the place of your lives, that's when the church will grow. We can no longer say that the church is growing because the organization is growing. We can only grow as far and as deep and as wide as you grow individually. There's a reality throughout all of scripture that the 10 commandments was written with a personal possessive you. It was meaning not you all don't kill. It was Thomas, don't kill. That's how we have to begin to read the word of God. That's not in the notes. That was free. The kingdom principles of honor, serving, and truth should direct everything the church does. There's a difference between serving someone to get them to your church and, there, and serving someone because the Holy Spirit direct you, directed you to serve that person. The motivation of why we do what we do fuels everything. Did the Holy Spirit direct the action or did the action come from the person's mind, will, or emotions? 
This is the critical thing we're discerning when we look at churches and individuals in those churches. So the psalmist wrote, who is man that you are mindful of him? Does our worship match up with the grace that we have received? When the tabernacle of David was erected in the book of Chronicles, we see four types of songs that were allowed to be expressed in the presence of the living God. A song to the Lord, that is us to him. A song about the Lord, that is us describing him. The song majesty comes to mind. A song to us from the Lord, his banner over me, his love. That's an appropriate word of use of the word us and I when we're singing when it's the Lord's voice over us. Or a song man to man. This is one that we grapple with so much as a church, a large C church, not just this church, a large C church, but there is, there's something called a song that's man to man, it's spirit to spirit, where the worship leader is encouraging. I think of the song gratitude where he says, come on my soul. He's calling himself up. And when you do that in the presence of the Lord and his presence is a testimony to the song that's being sung and you can find that truth in scripture, things break off and break free in your life. A song is not just singing, but it's an expression of a creative proportions that gives prominence to the creator. A song can encapsulate joy, war, somberness, exhortation, gratitude, testimony, and even celebration. Each expression can come from different cultures, tribes, and tongues. Culture introduces style, and style presents a personality. The personality of a person or people can be humble or it can be proud. Pride brings destruction, while humility brings anointing. We must see and celebrate anointing over culture, style, and personality. We are a church that gives room for the moving of the Holy Spirit. Every spiritual gift is for us today. We celebrate freedom and a worshipful expression in place, an expectation of personal responsibility on the one expressing. We will not tolerate self-promotion, self-proclamation, or self-projection. For any of these acts, rob our Savior of his hard-earned glory. At a regular Sunday worship service, you could see someone dancing or flagging, painting, singing, lying face down, sucking carpet, standing with their hands or with their hands in their pocket, journaling, reading, or even reading their Bible. We are aware it's not customary in most churches. So what? More importantly, what is our metric of normal? First, uh, First Peter 2, 9 says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a royal, holy nation, a special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into the marvelous light. We're people hungry for the presence and the glory of God to occupy every aspect of our lives. We believe in words of wisdom. We believe in the discerning of spirits. We believe in prophecy. We believe in words of knowledge in various kinds of tongues and the interpretation of those tongues. We believe in healing and signs and wonders, miracles and the gift of faith. We're odd in the church world today, we're odd. And I like it. I think God wants it too. Our church is the tribe of people where the Holy Spirit has given place and prominence above wisdom or strategies of men. We're co-laboring with heaven and kingdom principles of honor, serving, and truth should direct everything we do. We're a tribe made of a kind of people who are spirit-filled and spirit-led. Revelation 7, 9 says, After this, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and for the lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. Just like the nation of Israel is one nation made up of 12 tribes, other tribes across the large sea church are a part of us and we're a part of them. Paul writes to the Galatians in chapter three, verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, nor neither slave nor free. There is no male or female for all are one in Christ. 
So when I mention the word kind in this next section, I'm not referencing culture or skin tone. I'm saying a kind of people who bear the image of Christ. For example, the persecuted church in China is of our kind. Like just the same as the recently saved former heathen of any persuasion is our kind as well. Because they belong to Christ. The word tribe is used for different expressions among our kind. Again, I'm not making a statement on an ethnic group or culture, but I am speaking to those who are your kind belonging to the family of God. How many of you have heard the word or the phrase, be kind? It's a phrase we hear all the time. You can go to a local establishment, Nadine's, the best food on earth. They have shirts there that hang on their wall that says, make America kind again. Take all your political baggage and throw it in the trash. That's still something of a heart cry that our culture is asking for. Why is the church not leading the way? That was not in the notes. No one wants to say it's overused because it might be rude. In fact, it would be unkind. Kind is a shorthand for the word kindness, which is responsible for behaving nicely. But there's a problem with the word nice. It's subject and it's fluid. Nice depends on your level of friendship with one another, the social settings and whether or not you're hungry. How many of you have been hangry before? Be kind is out the door. There exists a large group of people who do, uh, who do not do nice things while they're intoxicated. This seems to be a strong and reasonable circumstance to par pardon any not nice behavior for any individual at any time. So all of a sudden, be kind doesn't exist. The person who was punched still has a black eye. The one who swung was a ghost named Ale, who will probably be back this weekend, but we know that the guy who threw the punch is not to blame. It was the drink. This is the one version of, this is one version that we have of being nice. Being kind is not a behavioral st behavior, but it's a state. It's a being. The word kind scientifically means the same species of a compatible family member. Cats go with cats. Dogs go with dogs. Elephants go with Thank you. Thank you, Randy. <laughs> Elephants. Set breeding purposes aside, a kind behaviorally treat their kin how they want to be treated. They live out the golden rule. We see many different kinds in the animal kingdom living a life of reciprocity, at least those living in family units. There's a study in chimpanzees that we, all, we always assume that it's dominance. The male who is most dominant is the alpha male. But in fact, they, find, they found in different studies that a male who actually practices generosity and reciprocity makes it to the alpha male more quickly and has a longer tenure on the top. Those kinds, sir, that, wasn't, that wasn't in the... So, I'm trying to tell you what's in here and what's not. So when you read it, you're like, he was making that up. <laughs> These kinds serve one another. They hunt for one another and protect one another. Therefore, they have at least in the micro, the ability to showcase the widely approved slogan or command, be kind. If only we knew the cost of living out those two words, be kind. Again, this is in the context of everything I've already said about living life in the spirit. Being authentically kind to your kind must flow from a deep belief that the person on the receiving end is actually your kin, your family, and your kind. That the person on the receiving end of your kindness is your responsibility and you treat them how you actually want to be treated. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, he put on flesh to become our kin, the firstborn son of God. It is his kindness that leads us to repentance. I'm sure glad he goes past nice and the father is kind. Anyone can be nice for a while. How many of you know that? But how are you doing with being kind? Have we embraced the annoying usher at church 
as a brother in Christ? Have you heard the truth of God? Someone is bringing in a different methodology and said yes to what they were saying and not how they were saying it. How about the sister who dances at the altar? Sorry, Katie, that's obviously about you. (laughs) Are they your kind? Are they your kind? Or does their behavior exile them from your tribe? Voiding out the title the father spoke over her or him, child. Are we not commanded to treat others the way that we want to be treated? Again, in the golden rule, I don't think this is a suggestion, just like in the great commandment or the great commission. God is not in the business of lofting up suggestions for us to maybe follow. Are we not commanded to love our neighbors as ourselves? Just as the animals walked into the ark two by two, according to their kind, we are called to walk our faith alongside others who are walking out their faith. A part of this word came to me when we were on sabbatical, walking the ark encounter in Williamstown, Kentucky. And it became abundantly clear that there, was, there were kinds and they were matched together on purpose for a purpose. You became a new creation at salvation. How many of you are proud of that? Say amen. And you did nothing to deserve it. That's even better. You became a new creation at salvation. Hence, there is no lifting, lifting any fleshly argument of this is how I am. Or I was born with this personality. Or I was raised in this manner. Let me, I'm going to read that again because I think I'm going to just can I take a step back and all this if you if you take this home and reread it or we email it out whatever if you've been listening for anyone else other than yourself you've missed the boat I have to read this for myself first I have to take this and audit it for myself first before I can bring it to you. And so that when I bring it to you, I hope that you're doing the same practice. I'm going to read this again. You became a new creation at salvation. So there's no lifting any fleshly argument. This is how I am. I was born with this personality or I was raised in this manner. Therefore, believer, you are a different kind than this world. So get healed. Get whole and behave in a manner worthy of the lamb's shed blood. Not that we take on an us versus them mentality to destroy the world and the lost who claim it as their home, certainly not. How can we reach the lost and graft them into the family of God and when we hate our own? Would you join a colony of cannibals? No. Would you join a military unit that's famous for shooting their own with exceptional merit in executing people when they're wounded. There is no kind and unkind camp to hang our hat on. Instead, there are two kingdoms, each producing its own kind. The kingdom of light produces children of light. The kingdom of darkness produces children of darkness. The fruit of visible evidence of your behavior shows what kind you are. Do your words and actions line up? The visual evidence shows that a tiger is not a lion. We behave as if we are from the tribe of light or of the tribe of darkness. So who is your kind? Who is your kin? Who is your family? How do you treat them? How do you speak about them when they aren't in the room? How do you serve them? How do you listen to them? And just as a reminder, be kind for you are an image bearer of Christ. So I have some follow-up questions. I'm gonna ask Cam to come back up and just lead us into a time of worship. I just, I really sense that this is a time of reflection. We intentionally make this altar bigger so it can be used. I know your chairs are super comfortable. We spent a ton of money on like the four inch padding.
but I can tell you, your body will appreciate you way more when you get hor- vertical on, or horizontal on the floor in the, in the presence of a living God than sitting in that chair. So I'm gonna ask you these questions and these are just a part of reflection that I wanna put out to you. And I wanna, and Cam's gonna come up and I want us to spend some time in worship and I'll come up and close. And question one, have you stopped growing in the things of God? I don't know how to answer the, the series of questions in the first paragraph. Should the church grow? How, how big should it be? But I can tell you this with all certainty and all confidence that you are supposed to grow. Have you stopped growing in the things of God? Number two, have you stopped co-laboring with heaven? Have you withheld your tithe? Are you not co-laboring with heaven with your money? Have you stopped serving? Have you stopped co-laboring with heaven with your time or your talent? Are you co-laboring with heaven? If you need more explanation on that, I would encourage you to read all of the book of Ephesians in one setting. You'll, it'll, it'll stick out more than ever. For our question, verse, verse three, question three, have you quenched the moving of the Holy Spirit? I have to ask myself this every Sunday, every Bible study, every time we gather in a corporate setting, is there any way I quench the Holy Spirit? This is why pastors nap on Sundays. That is a haunting question. Verse four, darn it. Question four. Oh, he humbles us in certain ways, doesn't he? Be humble yourself. Question four, are you struggling with the fear of man? It's hard to live a life in the spirit when you're struggling with the fear of man. Ray Hughes in his podcast, he put it this way. He goes, there's not a songbird in the forest who won't stop singing when men enter. Are you hanging up your song because men enter the room? You could have fear of man. Question five, have you judged or condemned another person's worship? I would just remind you what the book of Luke says, that you'll be judged in the same measure measure that you judge. If you're using your personal expectations, pet theologies, or anything of yourself to judge or measure or value anyone's expression to our heavenly father, that same measure will be used on you and you reap what you sow. This, that, that is a cautionary tale that is true. It's a, it's a principle that's true throughout all of scripture. Question six, I almost said verse six again. Question six, when was the last time you celebrated a kingdom victory with a person who's different than you? like totally di- different style, different personality, but they're of your kin. They're of your family of God. We have a statement here at New Life that we're contributors, not consumers. We are the church and we exist for the world. There was fires in Medical Lake all through our community. Our church came together and collected several items for donation. And over 20 people that served on the Iberia team and seven youth students went over to Medical Lake on Monday and served that community the entire day. When's the last time you celebrated someone who did something for the kingdom that wasn't in your group, wasn't in your style, wasn't in your bent? Question seven, do you have any unkindness you need to repent from? I use the word unkindness as more as a blanket word, but I'm talking about judgments. Have you metaphorically thrown any rocks someone's direction? Have you tried to pull them down or blow out their candle? Any type of unkindness in any manner that you need to repent repent from? There's a wonderful book I would encourage you all to read. It's an analogy book and it's called the the autonomy of peace. And in this book, it summarizes 
that when your spirit is at war, it doesn't matter the word you say, people pick up on the war that's within. So I read that book and I immediately wrote out three apologies to three leaders, three family of leaders who have left our church that when they left our church, I became, my spirit was at war with them. I was saying maybe good things with my mouth, but my spirit wasn't. I had to apologize for that. I wrote those letters and sent them out. And we're in those three families, we're in good standing with all three of those families. I had to audit that for myself. See, I'm trying to lay track that I'm looking at myself. Search me and know me. If there's any evil, wicked way in me, expose it. I want to pray these things first, ask myself these questions first. Is there stuff I need to work on? Absolutely. Hopefully we're growing together. I'm going to ask number seven again. Do you have any unkindness you need to repent from? Let's pray. I'm going to let worship the, let's do a couple songs, maybe one song. I don't know how long we'll go. We can burn some roast. Let's just go to like one. Just kidding. Let's pray. If, if you want to stand with me, please do. If you need to take a posture of sitting, that's totally fine. If you need to suck carpet, do it. Make an altar wherever you're at. Holy Spirit, come. Fall on this place. We're hungry for you to move in us and through us. We're hungry for you to change us. I pray that the fire from your throne would set ablaze and an uncontained burning and purging of everything in us that shouldn't be in us. I pray that we would truly be spirit-led and spirit-filled. I pray that we'd be, begin to be kind I pray that you would give us language and vision for one another. I pray that your spirit would fall on this place. Let's go after it. Andrea, can you can you come share that word? So during worship, uh, toward the end of worship, out of the blue, I saw in the spirit it's hanging right over here this giant. It's like a spine. It was curved, kind of looked like an embryo, but it was not of God. It was an embryo growing, and it was not of God. And I ended up going into intercession on stage, but what it means is that something, a seed of the enemy had been planted and it had been growing. And that's a different scenario than just simply God convicting you of something and then you repenting. This is a seed of the enemy. And so what he wants to do is to, uh, the Holy Spirit will come on those of you have, who have received that seed of the enemy that has affected your mindsets, your actions, your thoughts, your paradigms. And I, to be blunt, he wants to bring an abortion to that because this is not an embryo of God. And the good news is that it's an embryonic stage. And so it can be easily defeated. And so the Holy Spirit would like you to ask him, have I received a seed of the enemy that has been growing inside of me? And what can I do about that? Thank you. Just take a moment, because I think the sermon last week addressed a lot of those seeds of the enemy. When my dad talked through breaking through curses, 
So just take take a beat, take two seconds and ask the Lord if if there's a if anything that's growing in you is not not of him or by you or around you or whatever preposition you need to wrap your head around. Because what the Lord wants to release is blessing. So my dad read the cursing side of Deuteronomy 28. The Lord wants me to release the blessing side of Deuteronomy 28. I knew I was going to say something like that. Deuteronomy 28. This is the blessing side. This is the blessing side. This is, this, is a, this is a scripture why I really don't like it when people throw out the Old Testament because this is what the new covenant does. This is Romans 8. Man, I want you to get fired up. I know the room feels somber and it's okay to stay there and it's okay to hold what, what the room is presenting as far as any grief and repentance and it's good to hold the promises of God that are on the other side of the hard work that the room is doing right now. And can I just say, as the pastor of this church, this is the most bought in this room has been on any sermon that I've given. Where there's unity of the brethren, the Lord commands a blessing. Let's read Deuteronomy 28. Blessed shall you be in the city. Blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall your fruit of your womb and the fruit of the ground and the fruit of your cattle, the increase of your herds and the young flock. Blessed shall be your basket of your kneading bowl. Blessed shall be you be when you come in and blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before they sh- be- before before you they shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways the lord will command the blessing on you and your barns and all that you undertake and he will bless you in the land that the lord your god is giving you the lord will establish you as a people holy to himself as he has sworn to you if you keep the commandments of the lord your god and walk in his way and all the peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the lord and they shall be afraid of you and the lord will make you abound in prosperity and the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your livestock and the fruit of your ground within the land that the lord swore to your fathers to give you the lord will open up to you his good treasury the heavens to give the rain to your land in its season and to bless all the work of your hands and you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. He shall only go up and not down. If you obey the commands of the Lord your God, which I command you today, being careful to do them. And if you do not turn aside from any of the words that I commanded you today to the right hand or to the left hand to go after other gods to serve them. What Andrew's word about the the seed and the embryo, that's another God forming in your life. That And it, it, it could manifest in several different ways. But I believe if you, if you did, and I've, The majority of this room was was really bought in to do the deep work. Watch what the Lord does. And we're not saying the best is yet to come because we feel like it's the right marketing slogan for us. We truly believe that the best is yet to come. Pastor Tom, come up. You have a word of knowledge for us. And this happened, you got, the Lord gave you this word while you were cooking barbecue. I was cooking dinner last night. The most priestly thing, barbecue. Ooh. It's anointed. So I was cooking dinner and <clears throat> heard Hashimoto's disease just go zoom like that. I went, I have never gotten that one before. So I looked it up and basically it affects the thyroid. It's an autoimmune uh, disease where the immune system turns on the body and it attacks the thyroid and causes the thyroid to underproduce. So there it is. Has anybody been diagnosed with Hashimoto's disease here? Would you stand please? Okay. We've got two. Anybody who has any kind of a Catherine also? Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Yeah. Awesome. 
Uh, anybody with any kind of a thyroid issue, I think the Holy Spirit is highlighting this because he wants to do something about it. Let's wait on the Lord. Let's wait on the Lord. I want to encourage you just to begin to receive those around and extend your hands towards these ones. We'll see where God's going here. Wow. When everyone stood up, the phrase, God's got something cooking. Love it. Kind of. Oh, man. Tom, when you gave me this word this morning, I just want to encourage your faith. I was like, you said, I think one or two. I, you said more than one. I was like, I've never heard of that. It sounds really rare, but apparently. I felt like there would be a bunch, actually. And I'm, I'm, blown, I'm blown back. I, I want to first thank you for your obedience to bring this word and to hear from the Lord. Lord, there's a disease that I that, that Tom is that you've given to Tom. I can't even pronounce pronounce and I don't care to. Lord, there's been a response in this body to heal the thyroid, to bring it back into alignment. There's a lot of things in our model of prayer that we can just go into and it's, it feels really natural and it feels right, but it's not always what the Lord is doing. So I'm just waiting on the right words. I'm just trying to teach in this moment as well. I'm waiting for what the Lord is saying. Holy Spirit, we ask right now in the name of Jesus for you to drive a stake between this ailment and the people who are standing. Drive a stake. Just as the story of Deborah, a stake was driven through the man's head to pronounce him dead. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would do the same thing. Drive a stake right now and declare that thyroid your ground that your kingdom would be fully manifested in their thyroid right now in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, I pray you would drive it out, drive out the sickness, drive out the sickness, drive out the sickness in the name of Jesus. Drive it out and cut it off. Drive it out and cut it off. Drive it out and cut it off. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that the right coding of your design of the thyroid would begin to download right now on each body that's standing. And that the faith in the room would say yes and amen. Yes and amen. Father God, and we ask for physical evidence that your hand has been shown, that you drove the stake, that you drove out the sickness, that you cut it off, that you downloaded a new DNA process for this thyroid to become in alignment with who you are and your design. In the Father's name we pray, in the name of Jesus we pray, in the Holy Spirit we pray that all these things come to pass. Let the faith of the room say yes and amen. Yes and amen. Praise, let's praise the Lord. 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 If you'd stand with me, I'm gonna invite the ministry team to come forward. If you need prayer for anything, don't come to church and not get it. We're here to pray for you and with you. We love you so much. We want to bless you. Again, what I read this morning is available in the lobby. If you want to pick that up, take it home, give me your notes. Um, I'll file them in my special cabinet. Just joking. The Lord is on the move, amen? The Holy Spirit wants to do something you've never seen before. I'm about to preach another sermon. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for who you are. 
Thank you for who you are, Holy Spirit. Purge us, continue to purge us. Grant us the gift of the fire from your throne. We are yours. We are open. We are ready to do all that you've commanded us to do. We love you. We love you. We love you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. We love you. Be blessed.